echo of my former self. If you think I am strong now, you should have seen me in life. My legs never tire. The sensations of life. Greetings, everyone. I am Archon Okvals, and welcome to the temple. Today we'll be looking at, without a doubt, the best piece of DLC content ever to be created. Neverwinter Nights 2, Mask of the Betrayer. I know, I know, that's a really bold statement to make. However, when you see just how much of an all-encompassing improvement to the base game Mask of the Betrayer is, I'm sure you'll agree with me, or at the very least understand my point of view. Mask of the Betrayer is chock full of lessons that creators can emulate and the audience can appreciate. And I aim to show you that. In this video you will learn how to properly raise the stakes of your story, introduce story elements that stick in your audience's minds forever, and finally how to maintain proper tension throughout your entire story. If you stick to the end of the video, you will become a more enthralling creator or an enlightened audience member. Without further interruption, let us don the mask of the betrayer and search for answers in our very souls. But first, a word from our sponsor, The View. As always, I will do my best to spoil as little of the story as possible. My goal here is to get you to learn the lessons of this DLC, but also to play it yourself if you haven't already. So, the story begins in an ominous barrow, surrounded by eerie runes and a piercing pain in your chest. Memories of the final battle swirl across your mind. The well-deserved death of the King of Shadows, the shouting of your companions, and a stone ceiling with the same structural integrity as the one from Gothic. Darkness follows, and after that, an unknown presence presses down on your body and soul. The runic prison that surrounds you offers little clues as to how you got here, and you wonder how long you will last. Thankfully, Will Smith's wife shows up and dispels the enchantments keeping you trapped. You rise to your feet and ask all the expected questions. You don't receive answers to all of them, but what you learn is already enough to shock you to your core. It seems that you are no longer on the Sword Coast, a place whose people consider you a famous hero, a place where you bear the noble title of Night Captain and your own stronghold. Oh no, now you are thousands of miles away, in a land called Rashomon. Almost everything you were used to seeing back home is absent here. The beautiful stone masonry of the city of Neverwinter replaced with simple wooden shacks, decorated with trinkets and totems of a foreign culture. Vigilant watchmen, noble knights, and powerful wizards are all replaced with hardy barbarians and mysterious witches. Even the unassuming forests and simple wildlife have now been replaced with primordial woodland, teeming with wild spirits. The locals treat you appropriately as an outsider, and the traditions of this land are completely foreign to you. To top it all off, your condition seems to be particularly insulting to the locals. You Enma. In each conversation you hear mention of people and places you've never heard of before. You are truly out of place here, alone and longing to get back home. And that is glorious. With all these factors combined, the conditions for exploration could not be better. The unanswered questions about the final battle, as well as those concerning this strange new land, hook you into the story within minutes. So, let's talk lessons. Whether you're a video game designer or a different type of storyteller, the introduction of this DLC is a goldmine of storytelling lessons. Thankfully, all the lessons in this segment are pretty universal. Whether we are talking about a game, TV show, or book story, building off of the finale is difficult. A lot of creators assume you should simply keep increasing the scale and scope with no regard for relatability or actual audience interest. Mask of the Betrayer does raise the stakes and scale of the story eventually, but first it creates a healthy sense of curiosity and wonder in the audience. They do this through a complete shift in the environment and people, a faraway awakening, if you will. Where are we? How does this relate to the end of the previous story? 
Why am I in this condition? All wonderful immersion raising questions. So as a game designer you can do the same with DLC, but it doesn't have to be some strange far away destination. Maybe just a warped version of the locations the player visited. Just as long as the locations and people are different in some way and the player character is as lost and confused as the players are. With TV or movie writers, it's a bit more difficult as you need to fine-tune the number of episodes the viewers experience as strangers in a strange land. My advice would be about 2-3 to three episodes of the Far Away Awakening experience to keep the audience guessing and debating. Then you can slowly roll out the answers to what happened after the final battle. Bonus tip for both game designers and TV writers. If the musical score is in stark contrast to the one in the original story, that is a huge boost for audience immersion in the strange new lands you introduced. The composers of Mask of the Betrayer, Rick Schaefer and Jeff Dodson really understood this lesson and, well, just have a listen to their amazing work. For the novelists it's basically the same situation as for the game designers. However, you can't rely as much on fancy visuals and music. This is why you should really take the time to describe the cultural and regional differences of this new land your protagonist found themselves in. You can do it via a novella or a full-blown novel sequel. So to summarize the lessons of this segment, a far away awakening is a great way to keep your audience's attention post finale. A different culture, landscape and people can even wash out the bitter taste of a poorly done ending. How do I know this? Because initially a lot of people weren't super happy with the original Neverwinter Nights 2 ending. However, due to the sheer amount of mysterious and foreign plot elements in Mask of the Betrayer, the story of Neverwinter Nights 2 rose from the status of decent to legendary. So remember, whether you seek to keep audience interest past your story finale, or a redemption for a shitty finale, a far away awakening goes a long way. This is going to be really tough to cover without spoiling the story, but I'll do my best. For those who didn't watch my first video, a defining plot element is a story element so tied to the main plot that it's impossible to imagine the story and franchise without it. If done well, it can keep your story relevant and unique for decades. However, the defining plot element does have… hmm… let's call them subclasses. The subclass we can find in Mask of the Betrayer is what I like to call a disturbing plot element. Its purpose is not just to help define the character of the story, like the barrier in Gothic 1, but to actually disturb the audience into a debate. And as we like to say in the temple, debates about the lore and story are the lifeblood of a franchise. This disturbing plot element in Mask of the Betrayer is called the Wall of the Faithless. I'll keep the explanation as brief as possible. In the universe that is the Forgotten Realms, all mortals are held accountable for their faith in the gods. Good or evil doesn't matter, just as long as they believe, conduct the proper rituals and pray, the mortal god contract stays intact. However, as in our world, there are mortals who reject the divine, maybe even actively go against it. These individuals are labeled the Faithless. A former god of the dead called Merkel devised a particularly terrifying punishment for these individuals. If a mortal is deemed faithless, their soul is sent to the wall of the faithless, which surrounds the city of judgment, the first stopping point for souls after death. Now as to what the wall does with these souls, well, it dissolves them into its structure until they are gone, soul and mind alike. Although I hear some of you argue, well, peace for oblivion, so what? A dream come true for a non-believer. Yes, but the way you reach this oblivion, well, 
I guess it's best to show rather than tell. At once, the wall shudders, convulses. The twisted figures trapped within cry out as one as the entire wall shifts. Limbs shudder, bones crack, and the greenish mold expands, covering faces, eyes, and mouths. The smirk leaves Bishop's face, replaced for one naked moment by wide-eyed fear. Can, can you hear it? In the screams. Underneath the screams. The reason you're here. They all know. They've been here longer. Decades. Centuries. The walls hunger. Take some more quickly than others. And some hold on. Pointlessly. Staving off oblivion. Battling for every moment. The wall shudders again. And you hear a sickening crack as Bishop is drawn further back into the wall. Green mold rushes in to cover his face and bursts forth from his mouth in a noxious plume. He's seen you, the god of the dead. They're coming, they're coming. Maybe I'm just easily scared, but this is still one of the most terrifying moments, not just in gaming, but in fiction as a whole, if you ask me. Naturally, the presence of such a terrifying entity as the Wall of the Faithless sparked fierce debate not just among the fictional characters of the universe, but the actual audience as well. When your audience is debating the same points as the fictional characters in your universe, this is your best case scenario. When done right, the disturbing plot element is even better than the defining one. The key words are when done right, but we'll go over that double-edged sword during the lessons. So what can be learned from the disturbing plot element? Well, the good news is that, once again, the lessons are pretty universal for both game designers and other creators. If you're not sure whether your story has enough interesting material to generate debate amongst your fans, consider disturbing them as a valid option. The disturbing plot element doesn't necessarily have to be an object like the Wall of the Faithless. It can be an event, a person, or even a force of nature just as long as its presence leads to genuine questions. Why does this exist? Is it immoral to support this thing? Is it really necessary? These questions, combined with a quality storyline, will do wonders for audience investment. For example, you can have a nation that prevails against the forces of darkness using a controversial weapon. Peace was achieved, but at a horrific cost, and the fictional characters of your universe have opposing opinions on the matter. It will then be up to your audience to debate on what the correct answer is. I'd like to give some more specific advice to game designers or TV writers, since their mediums have the advantage of visuals and audio. You know that people like beauty and pleasant sounds, so maybe your disturbing plot element can be a location that distorts both of these qualities. Take elements from real phobias like trypophobia and combine them with distorted ambience and music that plays backwards. Leave the origin of this location vague, and let the audience be disturbed as they debate its purpose. However, as I said, the disturbing plot element is a double-edged sword. Go too far, and you risk the audience thinking you're just hoping to achieve a cheap shock factor. Even worse, you can actually turn the audience away if the plot element is too disturbing. Holy fucking shit. So remember, a well-executed, disturbing plot element, combined with a great story, can not only improve your work, but possibly even redeem it from a past failure. Oh, and I hope you don't do something silly like retcon a well-done, disturbing plot element for no reason at all. Imagine like if the Wall of the Fateless was retconned, for example. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> wait... No... No... No! That was it. Now he's gone completely crazy. That's right. If you play Mask of the Betrayer, you will get a chance to talk to... God! Well, not quite. Not THE God. A God. No talks with over God Ao, I'm afraid. No, you get a chance to talk to Merkel, the God of the Dead, who is now himself dead, or rather as close to death as a God can be. This conversation takes place on the literal corpse of said God as it drifts through a sea of stars. Merkel's glowing eyes and haunting voice make each sentence linger in your mind longer than it should. 
And yes, this is the same miracle that made the Wall of the Faithless. So, not only are you introduced to an awesome disturbing plot element like the Wall of the Faithless, but now you get to debate its existence with its maker. I can't tell you how good it feels to debate an act of God with an actual God. It really makes you feel like your character has agency in the story and isn't just a silent observer. At one point, Merkel even starts roasting your companions, and if you stand up for them, there's a good amount of loyalty points in it for you. And the best part of all, when you are done destroying Merkel with facts and logic, you can just wipe him from existence. I always choose the more patronizing option as it seems to piss him off the most. Oh, I will leave, Merkel, but not before I grant you the peace that you rightly deserve. It is not yours to dispense judgment, Spirit Eater. The hunger of the wall holds no sway over gods. You cling to an empty life, Merkel, afraid of what lies beyond. Let me show you peace. You have no right. Judgment is the purview of gods. In all you do, you glorify me, Spirit Eater. You stoke the embers of my soul. And now I will snuff those embers out. Farewell, Merkel. The final irony, even in this. So what can a game designer or some other creator learn from this segment? Well, as a game designer, the more agency you give to the player, the more investment you can expect. Within reason, of course. If you have a disturbing or really any kind of vague plot element that your players are interested in, a chat with God might just be what you need. However, don't be constrained by the idea of it just being a deity. It can be a legendary figure from your world's history, a force of nature, or even a demonic entity opposed to everything human. Apart from just offering unique dialogue options to question this otherworldly being, you can also implement dialogue options based on the things the player has done. That way, the player's arguments are based on their own choices and the lore of your world. Arguably, this is how you get the most from this plot instrument. Now, TV and film writers are in a bit of a bind, since screen time is limited, and if people aren't engaged in a debate, they can get bored more quickly. One way you can fix this is if you take out the calm elements of the debate. The main character and the otherworldly force have such opposing views that one might perish at any moment. Maybe there is a third, unknown force coming to destroy them both, so the debate time is limited. You can also make this otherworldly force, or god, give the main character a set amount of time to argue their points, raising tension in the audience. As a novelist, you have it a bit easier since readers are more patient and you have more page time. However, don't take this as an excuse to have pages and pages of mind-numbing exposition. This is stupid, I wanna talk about the For game designers, adding dialogue choices based on the actions of the protagonist is a choice. For novelists, it's a must. Not only because in a book you only have one set of dialogue options, but even more so because the perceptive reader is rewarded for paying attention. If the protagonist is arguing with a higher power, using his actions from earlier in the novel to prove his points, that is one big... <laughs> ...moment for your audience. Be careful, however, as you can alienate your readers if the protagonist's points are stupid. You gotta do better, Senator. You've gotta... So, that marks the end of the story and setting lessons. Now, let's get to that sweet, sweet gameplay. So, after your far away awakening and subsequent rescue, you slowly make your way out of the mysterious cavern you found yourself in. The ominous runes, abandoned campsite, and guardian elementals give the impression that this was some kind of prison. For what exactly, you do not know, but pretty soon you get an eerie hint. Right as you exit this cavern, you are set upon by a pack of spirit animals, or Teltors as they are known in Rashemi folklore. The leader describes your presence as a poison at the heart of their spirit dreams. 
Before you even have a chance to explain yourself, the poison the she-wolf spoke of takes over you, and for a brief moment you experience what it feels like to be a reaction YouTuber. Just before leaving the barrow, you encounter the spirit of a long dead bear king called Oku. He does not elaborate on why he wants you dead, so you have no choice but to fight him in order to leave. Later, in the city of Molsantir, or rather its dark counterpart on the Shadow Plane, you come across a bloody operating table. If your character has enough constitution, you can see a vision of yourself being thrown into the ruined circle you awoke in, into the hungry, ravenous void. Finally, when Oku returns with a spirit army to lay siege to Molsantir, and you beat him again, you learn what you truly are. A Spirit Eater. The Spirit Eater is without a doubt the scariest Rashemi legend. It tells of a cursed individual or multiple individuals roaming the Rashemi countryside, devouring all of the sacred Teltor spirits, and only stopping when the curse eats them from the inside. A legend that is, unfortunately for you, very real, and there is no known cure. But this isn't just a piece of dialogue that appears once or twice with no real impact on the game, it is very real and keeps the tension strong throughout the game. It does this via a gameplay feature called the Spirit Energy Bar. The lower it gets, the worse the side effects become, until you eventually die. The bar slowly goes down each time you rest, and I don't have to tell you how important rest is in a game with a D&D rule set. There are two ways to go about handling this, suppression of the Spirit Eater's hunger, or surrendering to it. Thanks to this amazing design of the Spirit Eater curse, there is almost not a single moment in this expansion that is without tension, and that is glorious. Whichever location you visit, the NPCs react to both your curse and how you are handling it. Some want to kill you and take it from you, and some wish to help you get rid of it. But no matter how much hope or fear you inspire, the dread of the rest is always there. The option to become a soul-devouring abomination is always there. And the specter of the origin of the curse looms above you through the whole campaign. The gameplay features that unlock in response to learning the origin of the curse, and how you handle it, are the icing on this delicious cursed cake of tension. So, let's go over the lessons. Game designers, limitations are a good thing. <coughs> if applied correctly. Whether it's a curse, a natural obstacle in the environment, or even hostile NPCs, the players will be more immersed if they are held back in the right way. If the player character is the subject of some kind of curse or fatal condition, don't let it remain in dialogue boxes and short NPC comments. Let it be visible on the UI, or have it affect the world around them in some way. Your goal when using a curse with tension is to have actual tension. Whether the player is fighting, talking, or resting, there has to be some level of risk or indication of risk. But a curse with tension doesn't just have to be a set of buffs and debuffs followed by eventual death. This tension can actually come from the player using their power. Then, if the player is careless, they don't have to die, but instead lose control of their character. Whichever method you choose, keep the tension healthy and ever-present. And for the love of God, don't introduce a cool curse in your game and five minutes later have an easy cure for it. TV slash film writers and directors, you're in luck. Since you have full control of the writing, visuals and audio, you can control the tension even better than the game designers. One scene with great action, writing and a killer soundtrack can build tension regarding a curse through an entire season. You can also try this, insert one scene that explains how the curse works. Once that is done, don't mention it for an entire episode, or several episodes. Then introduce the element that triggers the curse, a rock, a person, a cosmic event, with visuals and soundtrack only. Then you sit back and watch the audience lose their minds. Again, visuals and soundtrack only. This is Svetlana, she's got my back. I would advise not getting killed by her. 
Her sword traps the souls of its victims in Bulgaria. As a novelist, you're going to have a harder time implementing a curse with tension, as you can't really rely on fancy visuals, audio or a user interface. However, you can still build excellent tension with subtle foreshadowing and then an oh shit revelation scene. You do this by having a repeating description or phrase of something related to the curse, maybe even the curse trigger itself, across multiple chapters. The readers should know at least something about the curse before the revelation. Then, once the curse trigger chapter happens, make sure the repeating description or phrase can't be missed by the reader. In other words, have a would you kindly moment. Whichever type of creator you are, remember, healthy tension is your friend. Make sure it's present in the entire story and your audience will be hooked. In my review of the original Neverwinter Nights 2 campaign, I criticized the cut content impact on some of the character storylines. Cool concepts and moral dilemmas were brought up, but never resolved. Some companions were given complete character arcs, and others had hints of one. It's also worth noting there wasn't enough companion banter, which in my opinion is very important in a party-based D&D game. However, what little was there was great. <laughs> Now don't you be bringing my mother into this. You'd best be careful, you simpering little father's girl, or you'll learn a thing or two about Iron Fist honor and manhood. Oh, you mean the two smallest things in all of Baron? <laughs> my suggestion was to lower the number of companions you have in order to flesh them out better. It seems Obsidian did in fact take this route, and the companions you get in Mask of the Betrayer are more interesting than most of the original campaign companions. But not all. What's even better is that, due to the smaller number of companions, the writers were able to give each companion a unique philosophy, one that you can discuss with them. Kaelin the Dove has by far the most interesting philosophy. Whether you agree or disagree with her points, you can't help but be fascinated by how she presents them and how they relate to her life story. As for the other companions' philosophies, well, I don't want to spoil anything. However, you don't really need me to explain why it's fascinating to talk to Itachi Uchiha, who is cosplaying as a shaman. My crime? It is a serious one. You see, I am too handsome to look upon. It is a burden I alone must bear. Besides, I have no interest in the softly flowing curves of the tattooed one with you, so you need not fear me as a rival. What did he just say? Although the amount of banter between companions is still low, I would say it's more clever and entertaining. A huge boost for the Mask of the Betrayer companions are the comments they have for each other, and how they react to those comments. I noticed that. Your eyes are like mirrors, which makes them doubly pleasing to me. It allows me to admire my reflection without need for a looking glass. I see. I hope you can, with eyes like that. I'm a lot to take in at once, so feel free to study me at length if you must. You are hurt, Ganyev of dreams, and that pain drives you to hurt others, for you have been taught that that is the wheel that turns the world. Ah. <laughs> However, despite these improvements, this is still a DLC, which means that time-wise, the companions in Mask of the Betrayer don't have the gameplay time to have proper arcs. Don't get me wrong, they do change throughout the story based on how you treat them, but the changes come super quick, as the story is naturally not as long as the original campaign. Sadly, the forced romance from the original campaign still remains in Mask of the Betrayer. Whether or not you feel the same way, I'll step through the gate and fight by your side until the very end. But I can't venture toward death without first knowing, one way or the other, how you feel about me. Well, alright, if Will Smith is okay with it, come here. But here's the thing, what the companions were denied by the shorter story of the DLC was made up for by reactive rewards during gameplay. Let me explain. Depending on how you handle your Spirit Eater curse and how much influence you have with your companions, you will receive two unique instances of dialogue per companion. In these instances, not only do your companions acknowledge your actions, but they actually reward you with a useful buff. These buffs can range from extra fortitude in resisting the effects of the Spirit Eater curse to useful stat increases. 
So you see, even though you don't have a lot of time with these companions and their arcs are short, the fact that they acknowledge your actions and reward you with gameplay bonuses makes you feel like you've known them longer. It makes you feel like you had a more meaningful journey with them, from which you've gained something useful. If you know of any other games that combine this type of companion acknowledgement and gameplay rewards, please let me know in the comments below. Luckily, the lessons from this segment are universal for all creators. There's just a slight difference in implementation based on the medium, which I will go over at the end. If you have characters in your story that don't have enough screen time, but you're certain the audience will love them, or maybe you're not, try using reactive rewards. Have the actions of your protagonist acknowledged by this companion, or companions, followed by a reward. A piece of information, a useful item, or even some kind of power, just as long as it's useful to the protagonist. Then take this character out of the story and see what the audience's reaction is. If they are sad, great, you know you can use this character again. If they are like, yeah I hated him, but he was alright in the end, it's probably best to keep him on the sidelines. You did your best. You can also keep these characters until the end of your shorter story while providing rewards, but keep in mind that you'll have to nail the character philosophies and reactions to the protagonist's actions. Game designers can use progressive rewards to keep the player motivated to interact with their companion. Novelists and screenwriters, in your case, I think that special plot revelations can be the best type of reactive reward you can offer. You can also add new powers, but keep in mind that they aren't as impactful as in video games, due to a lack of interactivity. So to sum this all up, a lack of companion screen time can be made up for with reactive rewards. Whether the audience is turning a page, watching the next episode, or going on another level in order to get to know their companions, make sure they receive acknowledgement and rewards. Now, full transparency here, the City of Judgment is a far cry from a fantastic endgame location, in terms of gameplay. It is arguably worse than the Halls of Erdoras, which I criticized in my Gothic 2 video. However, in terms of plot, it's the perfect location. In the last segment, I mentioned how gameplay can make up for the faults in the story. This segment, however, will be about how the story helps the gameplay feel better. After retrieving a powerful artifact from the first game, you unlock a gateway into the realm of the dead. More specifically, you appear before the gates of the City of Judgment, the place where all souls go to be judged after death. And the first thing that you see when you gaze at the city is the mass of screaming, tortured souls within the wall of the Faithless. The City of Judgment is colorless and purposefully bland, built upon a flat, featureless plain, underneath a perpetual grey sky. The mark of the current god of the dead, Kelemvor. A foreboding spire looms over the houses and temples of the city. Although there are lights in the homes, only the fenders roam the city's lifeless streets, no doubt in response to our presence. For reasons I can't reveal because it will spoil the plot, we are here to find a certain book, which will then lead us to a certain part of the city. Naturally, the city's defenders aren't going to allow us to do that. They have the numbers and the advantage of the city's defenses. However, our force, consisting of Celestials, Undead and Dragons, is a bit more flexible. We will attack the city from two sides, here and here. A small elite strike force with me at its head will carve a path to our destination through this area. Let the third crusade against the city of the dead begin. Just to refresh your memory, our journey started in a backwater village located in a swamp of death and is now ending before the very gates of the City of the Dead. When I said in my last video that this DLC turns the good story of the original campaign into an unforgettable one, this is what I meant. Yes, gameplay-wise it is not the most interactive endgame zone, but just the very importance of this place in the D&D cosmology is enough to make the gameplay feel fantastic. The debate you had about the wall of the faithless, your own curse, and the very nature of the relationship between mortals and gods are all wonderfully covered here. Through special dialogue options, unique gameplay sequences, and different endings to the game, you get a massive payoff for everything that was set up in the beginning. Not only are you put at the head of this incredibly impactful siege, but the consequences of the choices you made are all present during the entire endgame sequence. And all of this is possible because a plot-perfect location was chosen for the finale of this DLC. 
The sheer presence and lore of this place, combined with some clever gameplay choices, make up for the lack of gameplay time and interactive environment. Just to reiterate, gameplay-wise, the City of Judgment is not the best endgame zone. Trust me, there are way better choices out there in that regard. But just by the fact of how perfectly it fits into the story, even the smallest gameplay elements in this area feel massively impactful. In other words, a plot-perfect endgame location can be a great solution to the underdeveloped endgame zone, which is most likely the result of a lack of development time. So, on to the lessons. Game developers, I understand that finishing a game is hard work, and the crunch culture is awful. Finishing a story is difficult. Finishing a game story may be the most difficult thing in all storytelling mediums. If it's for some reason unfinished or rushed, your audience will criticize you, there is no escaping that. However, you can minimize the dissatisfaction by designing an awesome location that fits perfectly into the story. For example, maybe it's a mysterious city, hinted at but never explored in your world lore the corpse of some long-dead entity with unknown origins, or even some kind of battle within the mind of your protagonist, just as long as it fits the plot like a glove and rewards player curiosity. Do not, however, think that you can use this as a cheap cop-out to avoid putting in the proper effort. The plot-perfect endgame location only works if you put in the work to make sure the players have already experienced an amazing story and world-building. Only then can they truly appreciate a unique place in your world. A place of legend, mystery, and possible foreshadowing. A place with unique visuals, art styles, NPCs, and ideally, really impactful choices. If you think you can bullshit your way with some shitty retcon that was never set up and expect the audience to be amazed, you're gonna have a bad time. Novelists and screenwriters, the lessons here are pretty much the same for you. Although you are free from the burdens of gameplay design, you still need to make sure the journey to the final location is amazing. Do so, and you can also avoid a bad time with your audience. Speaking of bad times... I'm really happy to say this section will be quite nitpicky, which means the developers did their job right, for the most part. Fortunately, the developers avoided some of the huge pitfalls of the original campaign. Underwhelming antagonist with lackluster personality and motivation? Gone. Replaced with a tragic and fascinating individual whose life choices actually generate debate among the fans of this DLC, and we both know why debates are good for your franchise. Lackluster and boring final stretch? Replaced with a legendary location in the lore of the Forgotten Realms, filled with iconic figures along the way. However, some of the problems have sadly remained. Once again, we have a forced romance, albeit with a little bit more build-up through dialogue. The companions, while better written and more reactive, do suffer from the same unused feature potential issues of the original campaign. Whether it's simply changing their minds suddenly due to a slight boost in influence, their arcs being done way too quickly, or just not going deeper into their quite interesting backstories, you can't help but notice this if you are paying attention. Furthermore, while the ending of the story is great, the endgame slides in the epilogue are a bit disappointing. Don't get me wrong, they are decent for your companions, but not so much for your character. More specifically, the Return to the Sword Coast endings. I'm fully aware I'm being nitpicky, but I would have loved a lot more than just You once again became the Night Captain of Crossroads Keep. Or You get married and a fraction of your original companions are there. I would have liked to have gotten confirmation in the slides regarding the fates of the other companions from the original campaign. In fact, we could have had something like the Dragon Age epilogue, where we get to chat with the old companions about their future plans. Maybe even a concrete ending to the story, rather than just leaving it up in the air with a greater Greater legacy legacy still. still. This is the last time we ever see our Night Captain, so in my opinion, leaving it mostly to our headcanon is not as satisfying. Another minor nitpick are the lore breaks we see throughout the gameplay at certain points. Like, for example, these two Nightwalkers here. In the original campaign, a Nightwalker was the unique avatar form of the main antagonist. 
Facing it and wounding it required a legendary extraplanar artifact. My lord still waits at the threshold of this tiny world. But his avatar is more than enough to end you and your army. And now, we see two of them guarding a vault and me killing them with a plus three long sword. Yes, I'm aware the Nightwalker exists as a unique creature in the bestiary now, yada yada yada, but come on, at least use a different model. The first time I saw this, I remember thinking, wait, I, I failed? The bad guy is back? Nope, just two random spawns guarding a vault. But like I said, these are nitpicks, and the lessons will be quite simple. Whether we are talking about a game, book or TV series that is on the shorter side, it is important to prioritize. If your character's story arcs or personality are in danger of being underdeveloped, see what unnecessary elements you can cut. A pointless, kind of lame metaphor scene that doesn't really add anything to the story. It's just some trash blowing in the wind. Do you have any idea how complicated your circuit- Cut it. A long, overly complicated time waster segment in a game. Cut it. A pointless, mundane routine scene that has no impact on the story. Cut it. Jesus Christ, we get it. His home life is boring. Now show me some. Ah, that's better. If you're finishing a long and legendary story, make sure to give your audience a proper sense of closure. This is especially important if this truly is the end, and we won't see the story's protagonist and supporting characters ever again. An extra endgame slide, an after credit scene, or an extended epilogue chapter. Just a little bit more effort in the end will mean a lot down the line. And lastly, keep an eye on those lore inconsistencies, especially if you are working with long-established franchises. It may seem unimportant in the long run, since a lot of people don't pay attention. But trust me, these mistakes tend to pile up if you don't pay attention. Yes, all the things I mentioned are more on the nitpicky side, I won't argue with you. However, if your fans are struggling to nitpick, then you know you did something right. So that would be all of the most important lessons from, in my opinion, the greatest piece of DLC content in gaming history. Trust me, this was not an easy conclusion to come to. <laughs> Listen to him. You have sent me a humble servant in us. <laughs> Honestly, it is so good, I would suggest playing the entire original campaign just so you can experience this DLC properly. In fact, I would say that the Night Captain's epic adventure without Mask of the Betrayer just doesn't work, like an F-117's invisibility. I'll repeat my earlier statement. No matter what type of creator you are, a good piece of extended content after the story is over, whether it's DLC, a short story or a short film, can really elevate your story to a higher level of quality. The lessons from Mask of the Betrayer will be especially useful to those creators who messed up the finale of their original story. In simpler terms, you can find redemption in the eyes of your fans if you've let them down before. Now, throughout this video you heard me say, novelists do this, screenwriters do that, game designers try this. However, that does not mean that these lessons are only for them. Even if they apply all these lessons to the letter, it means nothing if no one notices, or if no one appreciates. That's where you come in, the audience. As always, your Archon Okvalds has a simple request for you. Identify, appreciate, and support creators who give you amazing additional content. Identify a faraway awakening, appreciate reactive rewards, and finally, support creators who take the time to make nitpicking difficult. An audience that keeps its creator on their toes and truly knows what makes a quality game, book, or TV series is one that is informed. And now, after watching this video, you'll be just a little bit more of a better fan who won't tolerate BS in their beloved franchises. 
Whether you're a creator or audience member, I hope these lessons have helped you to either create or preserve quality storytelling. And so your taste develops further. So, it seems our travels in the Forgotten Realms have come to an end. For now. Our next adventure will be a bit more comedic and draconic in nature. Once again, I am grateful to you all for making the long journey up the mountain. With each of your visits, the temple comes to life more and more, and I'm happy to see the number of visitors is increasing. Feel free to like, comment and subscribe, because it really does help with the upkeep of the temple and its future functions. Have a safe path down the mountain, and I'll see you next time in the temple.